In an introductory press conference before the 2010 NBA season, when Derrick Rose came out and said this, The way I look at it within myself, why not? Why can't I be the MVP of the league? Why can't I be the best player in the league? I don't see why. Why? Why can't I do that? This statement seems kind of wild at the time. I mean, people appreciated his confidence, but like this was a league with Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Dirk Nowitzki, and other superstars that had established themselves as MVP runners and MVPs in general for a long time. And this third year kid, this 21 year old playing for the Chicago Bulls thought he had a chance to be the MVP. And well, this statement became iconic. It became legendary because um, he did it. <laughs> and it's always going to be iconic. It's always going to be legendary. And given the circumstances, his injuries, and how his career has kind of gone since then, some people probably want him to hold on to this award. A lot of people probably want him to hold on to this because this is a legendary thing in NBA history. But I think if you're a Derrick Rose fan or if you're just someone who wants Derrick Rose to continue to be the youngest MVP in NBA history, I think the biggest test is coming this year because the man Zion Williamson from the New Orleans Pelicans, I think if there's someone who's going to break this record heading into his third season, Zion has a chance to do exactly that. And I'll let you know how just before I do that, if you could drop a like on the video, if you're new to the channel, subscribe to it. It just helps out a ton. It would be much appreciated. I make content like this every single day and doing so, it just helps out. Now, let's get the obvious out of the way. People are going to be saying straight away, how's Zion going to win the MVP when his team sucks? I mean, that is a valid question. That is a very valid question that uh, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of, but at least my thought process is, well, he does need to win games. He definitely needs to win a lot more games than the 31 games they won this season in a shortened season. And, well, he's going to need to do that because, I mean, you look at the MVP over NBA history, I think Russell Westbrook had the least amount of games won or at least the worst seeding in NBA history for an MVP, and that was a historic triple-double season. So it's not really a light thing. Games won are very, very important. And I would have mentioned that in the title of my video, but I mean, how does it sound if I say Zion Williamson can be the 2022 MVP if Steven Adams and Eric Bledsoe are traded, if they make some adjustments and if they utilize him properly like they should? Uh, well, that doesn't really catch as much in the title. So I didn't put that in there, but yeah, I'm going to preface that. They need to win more games. They need to make some trades. They need to make some adjustments, but it's not nothing crazy in my opinion. Otherwise, I wouldn't be saying this. But I'm not going to talk about the optics in terms of trades, but just looking at Zion as an individual because right now we've got enough to go off because this was just his first regular season in which he, he was ridiculous. Like there's no other way about it. One of the best second seasons in NBA history, particularly considering he only played 30 games in his first year. Just the numbers, the impact, everything he did in year two was absolutely absurd. And if you look at the numbers and as someone who can attest to these numbers, because I watched pretty much every Pelicans game on the season from February onwards, when he started being incorporated as the main ball handler, as the main option, as the guy on this team from February, he averaged 28.2 points a game, seven rebounds, over four assists on over 62% shooting from the field whilst getting to the line nine times a game and shooting over 70% from the line. I mean, you see the names on this list. This is over 40 games of the season. I mean, just in general, his numbers on the season, I don't really need to use a smaller sample size, but this is when he started being the number one guy. And since he's been the number one guy, I mean, you see the names, like they're not normal names. You've got the Greek freak, the two times MVP, the guy that has shown how you can win an MVP award just ahead of him with pretty similar numbers offensively, not quite the same efficiency, not as efficient. When you talk about offensive potency, forget about his age, forget about his year, his rookie class. I don't care about any of that. In terms of in the NBA, he's in the top 10. He might be even higher. When you're just talking offensive, when you're just talking someone who can score at such a rate, at such an efficiency that is really unmatched in NBA history, and that's not hyperbole. He's genuinely unmatched in NBA history when it comes to efficiency. But as I alluded to at the start, if you want to win an MVP, you've got to win games. It's really that simple. So before we even talk about him potentially putting up better numbers next season, having more usage rate, just being even crazier than his second season, let's talk about the Pelicans because they're they're very important. Jokic said it in his most recent MVP statement, and he's being humble. He's a very humble guy, and I'm sure Zion would do the same if he won the MVP award, but he said it was all about the team, and he's really not lying. 
You really need your team to be good. You need your coaching staff to be good. You need a lot of things to go right to win the MVP award. Well, I mean, you look at their record and you see 31 and 41 and you think to yourselves, it's going to be hard for them to get to 50 wins, which is probably where you need to be in an 82 game season. And how are they going to do it? I mean, they're not just going to spawn in with an extra 10 wins. So that's not going to be the option. They're going to have to start by just doing a lot of things better. And let's start with the optimistic things. I think straight off the bat, like I mentioned in the last 44 games of the season, when Zion was the go-to guy and they figured that out, the Pelicans went 22 and 22. So that's okay. That's 500. 500, we've got things to work with from there. But I want to go a step further because they could have gone a lot better. Like this comes down to the maturity and some of those things are still going to be an issue next year. But they had 14 double-digit leads blown. Yes, 14 of them. That was the most in the NBA this season by a long shot. I don't know if it's an NBA record, but it would be close. That is a lot of blown double-digit leads. And a lot of it came down to just some seriously dumb things from everyone. I mean, just off the top of my head, I can remember one where Lonzo Ball against the New York Knicks. The Knicks needed a three-pointer to tie the game. So you normally give up the two. He goes to defend the two, leaves open the wide-open shooter. The Knicks hit that three, goes to overtime, and they win. Or was that three for the win? I don't exactly know but it was one of the dumbest mistakes. Stan Van Gundy said it himself. Lonzo said it himself. And that wasn't an anomaly. There were mistakes like that practically every game. And a lot of them came down right in the last minutes of the game. It was bad. It was a bit of a catastrophe when it comes down to it. And it wasn't just because of mistakes made by the players, the coaching staff, and what they did early in the season. I mentioned how Zion started to get more responsibility as the season went on. Well, early in the season, they were going through Brandon Ingram a lot in the clutch. And we're not going to be here and discredit him as a player. I think he's a good player. Look at these numbers. These are the clutch numbers. Basically, in tight situations down the stretch, these are who puts up the best, most efficient numbers on the Pelicans. You see the numbers. This is a reason why they lost 22 games in the clutch, which is the fourth most in the NBA this season. Because, I mean, forget about Brandon Ingram. Outside of Zion, no one could score at an efficient rate. No one could make decisions. And I watched, again, I watched most of these games. So I'm not just looking at stats to tell you this. I genuinely watched these games with my very own eyes and saw people making atrocious decisions, taking atrocious shots. And Zion getting iced out of multiple games in which he had dominated for three and a half quarters and then all of a sudden, in the last two minutes, they just decided, look, let's not pass it to him. Let's not pass to the most unstoppable scorer since Shaquille O'Neal. Let's not do that. So that's what happened for way too long of the year. The last couple of months, though, they started to fix that and they got a bit better at winning and trying to make the right decisions. But it was a calamity. And some of that comes down to being young, coaching decisions a lot of things, but if they can fix that, which it's fixable. When you have Zion, you should be winning your share of close games because those numbers he has right there are as good as most people in the league. They're superstar numbers in the clutch. He's a closer. I know people don't like to say that about people who can't shoot because there's this idea that if he can't shoot or he doesn't have some kind of bag, he can't close out games. Those numbers suggest otherwise. Looking at the games, watching him take over games in the last two minutes also suggest otherwise. He can close games and he's going to need to close games. Also, Ingram can be that guy. Lonzo can space the floor. Like, you can still have those guys be options, but just don't run the offense through Brandon Ingram in the clutch. Give it to your superstar player. But I think just one more thing before I talk about the potential improvements in Zion's game individually. I think as a team, the Pelicans, they had a lot of health issues. Josh Hart, who was a key piece, got injured. They had guys coming in and out. I mean, JJ Redick got traded after he had a terrible start to the season. Brandon Ingram suffered injuries. Lonzo suffered injuries. Zion was healthy for the most part. And then at the end of the season, when they realized they couldn't make it, he sat out with a wrist injury because he was getting hacked every single play, every possession, which is another thing, which we may as well just segue into it right now. Pelicans, stay healthy. We can't really talk about that. I mean, staying healthy is something we can't forecast, but in in terms of talking about getting hacked, I mean, uh, he needs to get more foul calls. I know he's averaging nine free throw attempts a game. That could be 15. Now we'll settle for somewhere around 12 because there's no reason he shouldn't be getting the most free throws in the league. And I'm not saying this is someone who really likes his game and wants him to succeed. I genuinely watch him play and see him get hacked about four times a game that isn't called, probably four times a quarter actually. Pretty much every time he drives to the paint, he's getting hacked. And well, <laughs> he needs to get more foul calls. And I think that's going to come with time. But why not this year, refs? He literally broke his hand David Griffin said it was because he was getting hacked and some people laughed at that, but I don't not believe 
believe that. I mean, if you've seen how teams defend him, they know. I'm pretty sure something came out about a player saying to Zion, we're going to keep fouling you because these refs aren't going to call anything on you. That was said. <laughs> like, what are we talking about right now? Give him more foul calls. Also, improve your free throw shooting while you're at it, which he did over the course of the season. He went from someone who was struggling at the start to ending up shooting about 70% over the second half of the season. And if he can push that to mid-70s, maybe 80s, that's probably a stretch, but mid-70s at the very least, more easy points, more efficient scoring, even better. And that kind of shooting, that free throw shooting segues into a next thing. In terms of scoring as a whole, I mean, he's going to get 28 to 30 points a game regardless, but maybe he's going to add a few little different grooves to his game. I saw towards the end of the season, he tried a few turnaround mid-range jump shots. He made a few. He was stretching out his range a little bit. He was taking more threes and his shot isn't broken. He's got incredibly soft touch. This is someone that can shoot the ball. He shoots over 70% from the line. As you saw in clutch situations, he was over 85%. This is someone who can shoot the ball. He's just decided, um, which isn't really a bad thing. Uh, I'm shooting 62% from the field. Why do I need to take mid-range shots when I can get to the free throw line or I can get to the rim literally every single possession? So that's probably why he hasn't taken any mid-range shots. If he can start to incorporate that into his game, it's not going to hurt at all. And I think we'll see it. I think he'll start to take like one three a game this season. In terms of probably the biggest two differences I could see happening this season, it's going to be his playmaking and defensively. Also the team hopefully being better because he spent a lot of time with his second unit, which had the likes of Najee Marshall, James Johnson, Kyra Lewis, Jackson Hayes, Hernan Gomez, some nice young players in there, but like it's the worst second unit in the NBA. And he was literally carrying that second unit, which is why he spent so much time with them because Van Gundy realized, um, we're going to need Zion to literally carry the second unit for it to at least be average, which he made it average. His on-off numbers are really good, which just goes to show how good he is when he's playing with a second unit like that, and he's still putting up those numbers even with the second unit. Ridiculous. But if you can improve the bench, the depth, and make some right acquisitions and trades, which again, not going to talk about, but... That will help his numbers. That'll help his efficiency. That'll help him not be incredibly tired throughout the game, which also segues into the defensive side of things, which I think some of it comes down to fatigue. People have mentioned, I mean, he's taking a huge load on. And then on the defensive side of the floor, players can often kind of neglect that if they've got a 30% usage rate or whatever Zion had, and they're taking such a big offensive load, the defensive side can sometimes get neglected. But he's proven at Duke, he can be a good defender. He got better as the season went on. A lot of his issues started off the ball. Different coaches, different environments, different players throughout his first two seasons. Didn't play a ton of matches. You can understand where the issues came from, plus fatigue plus the injury concerns. I mean, as someone who's played sport, when you're handling the ball and you're moving towards the rim, you feel in control. You feel like you can move laterally. You can take those sharp directions. But defensively, if you've had injury problems, sometimes you feel like, well, you're not in control because other people are making you move where they see fit. So that's why I think sometimes he looks a little bit hesitant defensively to use that athleticism. And that's why sometimes he moves a little bit strange defensively. So I think if he can sort that out, more of a mental thing, in my opinion, from what I've seen defensively, if he can improve those things, he's going to be okay defensively. And then people can't really hold that against him. And then playmaking. This is where we could see the biggest jump. He could average five to six assists a game. He's someone who can pass out of double teams, which are going to consistently come for him because the numbers don't lie. He is an unstoppable scorer, regardless of who you go up against. Rudy Gobert couldn't stop him. Joel Embiid couldn't stop him. Draymond Green did a pretty good job on him. But like the reality is no one is stopping him one on one. So you're double teaming him and you're leaving open hopefully shooters. Get him some shooters. That would be nice. Not Steven Adams and Eric Bledsoe, but you're leaving open hopefully shooters for them to knock down shots and improve his assist tally. He got better as a passer. He started making more advanced reads, better reads. Like in general, as the season went on, you got to see some of those point guard skills that we've always heard about with Zion because in high school, he was a point guard. He's capable of handling the ball for long periods of the game. He's capable of making passes out of double teams, off the dribble, off penetration. It doesn't matter. His assists are going to go up as they went throughout the year. I could see him averaging five to six assists per game. Pair that with like 30 points on 60% shooting. And if the Pelicans can make the right adjustments around him, if they can stop choking games, they could win somewhere around 50 games, 45 games to 50 games, which is optimistic. But this is why it's a hot take, obviously. But that's optimistic. If they can do that, 
paired with the narrative that he's taken a team that won 31 games this season to a team that maybe wins 50 games next year in just his third year, we could be looking at the youngest MVP in NBA history. That's at least my thoughts on the whole topic. Let me know how you feel.